The uh, the date is September 11, uh, and that means uh, obviously something in this country along the lines of December 7 to the, the generation that experienced that. And uh, there are some people in our community who were in either the Pentagon or they were in New York uh, during 9-11. We've done numerous shows in regards to that, including a 20th anniversary program that uh did the full two hours on that. Our first guest is a Marine Corps veteran. He is a member of the House of Delegates in the 100th, Bill Ridenauer. He was uh, at the Pentagon when those planes hit in 2001. Bill, good morning. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. Can you tell us about your experience on September the 11th, 2001 at the Pentagon? Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So I was in the, uh, office of Naval intelligence at the time. Uh, I was in the B ring. Um, the way that the aircraft hit, um, it was headed probably 20 yards from where I was sitting, uh, but ended up, um, obviously when it collapsed into the building, um, I was probably somewhere between 30 and 45 yards away from uh, where it ended up. Um, it um, when I w we obviously observed what was going on at um, the towers in New York, and my previous one of my previous positions from 1996 to. 1999 was uh, the anti-terrorism operations officer out in the Pacific Command, and I was um, extremely familiar with Al Qaeda as a result of that, uh, and the Iranians and, and their terrorist operations. Um, and it was instantly apparent to me that they were um, that the plane that had hit the building had been one deliberate and two was a terrorist attack, and it was what we had been looking at considerably of during my time out in the Pacific Command uh, as a gravity attack. We had seen that in 1993 in Beirut, Lebanon, with the Marine barracks bombing and uh, the embassy bombing. Uh, the um, Oklahoma City uh, attack, the uh, Kobar Towers attack on the Iranian Kobar Towers attack against the U.S. Air Force barracks. Um, there, all, all of those had been designed to hit relatively low into a building, uh, usually at the ground level. We hadn't seen an aircraft attack like that uh, in order to cause a structural collapse and then collapse the, the building. I, I didn't realize at the time that Al Qaeda's intent actually was to topple the buildings. That was the uh, overall intent of uh, AQ in order to try and create even more casualties by toppling buildings on top of other buildings. Um, as it was, they, they collapsed directly upon each other. So um, when I was watching, because we had a TV in our, our office, um, I felt a, a very strong shudder, um, unlike anything we'd ever experienced. And frankly, um, we we had aircraft that flew over the Pentagon from National Airport, so uh, we had a window. It's one of the few times in my career I had a window, and you could see aircraft coming over. And we had often commented about, you know, how easy it would be for an aircraft to simply fly from National and come into the the Pentagon, but this one came in via uh, Arlington. So um, when I felt that. Um, I went and there were a series of stairs that was our back door, which was away from where the, the aircraft had hit. And I went down, um, and there was a guy behind me. Um, we went into the corridor. I started moving towards where I had felt the shutter come from along the corridor and, um, to my dying day, I'll, I'll never forget um, seeing a very large, very large black lady um, running. She was 
I've never seen anyone more terrified in my life. There was a, another woman, I think it was a woman, running next to her, and they were moving and looking back as fast as they could go. And uh, I proceeded down the corridor, and frankly, I don't know what happened after that for about 8 to 12 minutes. Um, I've, I've looked at that a lot of times, and I think it's mainly because, frankly, I don't want to remember what happened at that period. So um, I, um, after a few minutes down in that corridor, I went back up, uh, like I said, about 8 to 12 minutes, ran back up to my office uh, to get as many people out of there. Everyone was gone except one other, under, one other individual. Um, and I then left, went down. Uh, the Pentagon police and others were telling people to go out. We went out the mall entrance, uh, the few of us that were remaining in the area. Most people had already evacuated. Um and then I ended up uh, getting up to uh, like the Roslyn uh, Metro Station. Um, didn't have a cell phone at that time. I uh, managed to get a hold of my wife. She was pretty emotional. Um, and then got home and watched the second tower collapse because the first tower collapsed about the time I got home. I got home somewhere between two and three o'clock in the afternoon. It just took a very long time to get back. Um, so, and then um, from there I started, uh, I went back the next day, um, had an interesting encounter with a media person, and I let them know in no uncertain terms I wasn't interested in talking to them. No offense to you all, uh, but I wasn't in the mood. So, uh went in and to the Pentagon and they told us when I got there, there was nobody there. Um, somebody came in and said, Hey, you're not allowed to be in here anymore because this is part of the investigative area. So I left and went up to the uh, Navy annex and um, they had started a new watch section. And um, I joined that watch section and did that for three weeks, um, finding every running every terrorism investigative lead or terrorism report that uh, we could find. We were working with FBI, Coast Guard, and, uh, other uh, service elements to try and identify any other potential attacks. I did that for three weeks. Um, unfortunately, um, obviously, there were many, many folks killed. We lost our watch section. About uh, 14 folks, really good folks. Uh, so I spent a lot of time going to funerals, um, about five or six. Missed a number of them because, again, I was on the Navy watch at that point, and so we were spending a, a lot of time, I mean, many, many, many hours trying to track down as many potential threats as we possibly could to uh, see what we could use uh, law enforcement, um, various military security, uh, counterintelligence elements to do to uh, neutralize those threats. Um, it, was, uh, it was an extremely difficult period. It was a very, very bad day. Feel right. um, just hard day. To, it's hard to say how bad it was. Um, yeah, and it, that started me on a counterterrorism career. It, the entire event was um, cathartic. I mean, it, it energized me to get back into combating terrorism. I tried to get into uh, combating terrorism based on my uh, time out in the Pacific, but there was no real interest in it, uh, not much interest in intelligence until after 9-11. After 9-11, that all obviously changed. Indeed. 
Bill Ridenauer, mm-hmm. our guest here from the 100th, Bill Stubblefield. Go right ahead. Yeah, good morning, Bill. Uh, we we had a local uh, uh, person, Don Marshalls, whose wife was killed there. It's always struck me that uh, there were three instances that day, uh, the Twin Towers, Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and the Pentagon. Of the three, the Pentagon has kind of slipped from our radar. We have more attention has been directed toward Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and the Twin Towers. Why is that, Bill? Do you have any idea? Well, I think in part um, because of the imagery of um, the aircraft going into the two towers, uh, there's virtually no imagery other than some still images from a, a, a close um, a security camera of the aircraft going into um, the Pentagon. Um, the, obviously, the numbers of casualties um, were. We lost Bill's line. Our apologies on that. I'll get in touch with uh, Bill to call us back here as quickly as we can. Uh, Maria, you haven't had a chance to ask Bill a question yet, but uh, your thoughts on what you just heard? I think his line's lighting back up again, but uh, where were you that day? Um, So uh, that day was um, the annual Day of Caring. That's right. And um, I was out on a project, ironically, at the time, um, I was the editor of the journal, um, and I was doing a gardening project. Don't laugh, audience, but I was doing a gardening project at Hospice of the Panhandle. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just sort of wound up there sort of randomly, and, um, you know, everybody, it's one of those days, times that you know exactly what you were doing, you know exactly where you were. Um, and, uh, I can remember then, um, Kathy Campbell and Margaret Cogswell coming out and saying, you folks probably want to come inside. And there were TVs, uh, that were, um, in the education room at the time. And, you know, I took one look and, uh, knew first off that I needed to get back to, to my, to my day job or my evening job, so to speak. And, um, you know, so we spent the day, lots of tears, lots of calling folks, lots of shock, um, recognizing that there were people in the community who were there. So, um, yeah, it's one of those indelible, um, memories that just sort of stay with you. Bill, do we have you back on the line there? Yeah, you do. I'm yeah. I'm not sure what happened. It just dropped for a second. Okay, very good. Uh, Maria, did you have a question for Bill while you had a moment? Well, um, you know, again, Bill, I think one of the things that you said, those 8 to 12 minutes that you just sort of don't even remember what happened. I think our memories sort of take care of ourselves in that vein um, and and what you did before, what you did during, what you did after, Um, you know, would you say, I think you you said this was uh, a pivotal time. It started you on your counterterrorism career. So in some ways you hear so many people who make the decision at that point that they are going to do military service or sort of change focus in what they were doing. That was a pivotal moment for you, do you believe? It, it was, but it, it was more that uh, I had the opportunity to do what I had wanted to do anyway, because I, I had wanted, um, after what I had seen doing anti-terrorism in, in the late 90s, mm. <clears throat> I had tried to get a, a position when I retired from the Marine Corps with uh, Department of um, state, uh, the Diplomatic Security Service is an assistant um, um, regional uh, security officer. Uh, but there was, like I said, very, very little interest in that in terms of uh, interest in expanding that program. I had worked with the RSOs quite a bit when I was doing anti-terrorism. And I, I knew that al-Qaeda was coming for us. I mean, it, that was blindingly clear from my time uh, in the 90s in, in the PACOM area, 
because of some attacks, the threats that we were seeing, the attacks out in, uh, in various areas in, in the Middle East. Um, so it, it, um, it was, it, it energized me a lot. I mean, at, at that point, point, I became very driven in terms of, um, that mission and it, it became a mission, uh, to avenge the, the folks that we had lost. So, uh, it was somewhat personal, um, not necessarily because they had tried to, uh, kill me and everybody else in the Pentagon. I, that's, I mean, I've been a subject of several, uh, terrorist attacks. So it, that wasn't the first and it, uh, wasn't the last, uh, but, um, it, it was personal in that they got friends of mine. And that made it a lot more personal. And it's something that, that caused me to say, well, you know, if, if they're going to make it personal, then I will make it personal for them too. Bill, how, how did you, from your career in the Marines and then the federal government, and then ultimately running for the state legislature. How do you transition uh, and, and and bring what you learned in that part of your life to the West Virginia legislature while you're seeking re-election? Well, it, you know, a lot of what I've um, brought to the, the role as delegate is what I learned in the Marine Corps, frankly. And that, that has influenced me throughout my life, and that's uh, a... Uh, focus on mission, a sense of mission, because um, that's what is absolutely driven home in, in Marines is that um, mission accomplishment is, is uh, absolutely essential. And it, in part, it's because of the, uh, the nature of the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps is uh, a luxury. It is not a necessity. The Army, the Navy, the Air Force are necessities. The Marine Corps is a luxury that the country indulges in uh, because we think that the Marines uh, are a capable, uh, effective force. Uh, therefore, in order to maintain our role as a capable, effective force, principally focused on amphibious operations, we have to be uh, extremely focused on mission and effectiveness, efficiencies, um, and and a spree, a, a um, sense of accomplishment that um, the nation can see, and that that translates into uh, what you see in the vast majority of Marines, where we tend to be much more driven than uh, most other people because of that necessity to to demonstrate that we are in fact effective and and capable. Assess your first two years in the legislature, what the learning curve is like, and what you think if you're uh, actually reelected, uh, the next two years would be like. Um, the the learning curve is, I, I had had experience uh, when I had been doing strategic counterintelligence after I had done my counterterrorism period uh, with Congress. Um, in terms of writing some legis helping write some legislation, the National Defense Authorization Act, um, doing some studies, um, a, a complete study and overhaul of the defense intelligence enterprise. Um, so I, I understood somewhat how bills uh, were uh, done. Um, there, there's been, you know, uh, quite a bit of. Um, bill writing that I've done, um, and, you know, I'm hopeful we're going to get some things done in the coming legislative session. Um, it's, there's, uh, there's a lot of focus on what's going on nationally, and that, that's a lot of what I've been focusing on is what we can try to do as a state to ensure that, uh, the federal government is, um, not engaging in actions that are counter to what the people of West Virginia want and need. Um, so, it, you know, as far as a learning curve, 
yeah, that learning curve's not over. It never really is, but there's a lot uh, to be done, and I'm hoping to do a heck of a lot more in the, the coming sessions. About two minutes left. Bill or Marie, you have a question for Bill? Yeah, uh, Bill, you've been described by some, some as being a social warrior. Uh, do you put yourself in that category, and if you do, what does it mean? I'm not sure what it means. Um, I'm not sure what a social warrior would be. I know what a warrior is. Um, I, I'm trying to ensure that we are standing up for kids, for women's rights, for um, particularly uh, where uh, folks are trying to groom children, where they're trying to uh, put men in women's sports, um, men in women's bathrooms, um, those things where, you know, potentially we see attacks on our First Amendment rights or uh, on our Second Amendment rights. Um, so I don't really think that would qualify as what some would define as a social warrior, but uh, I don't... I'm, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, labels are fairly easy to be thrown around. Uh, let me get specific right. if we have time for one more. And looking at your uh, platform, you say stop funding companies that despise West Virginia uh, that seek to ruin our way of life. Do you have any companies in mind that would prompt that statement? Bill, I only have 60 seconds for your response. Okay. Yeah, that would be the Forum Energy um, in my mind, debacle in 2023, where we uh, provided $290 million to a company that was really already being funded by or would be funded by uh, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, um, and then provided them with a facility that at the time we valued at about $850 million um, for a startup company that has a unproven technology. Uh, that company is, uh, has advocated um, a lot of the things that are, in fact, contrary to the values of the vast majority of people in West Virginia. Bill, and not, not um, I have and, to jump in because, unfortunately, yeah. we have run out of time. Uh, we promise to have you back on to get more into some specific West Virginia legislation and policy, but I do appreciate you sharing your 9-11 uh, memories from the Pentagon. I'm much appreciated, sir. Okay, have a great day.